everyone, and welcome to Pearls on Gloves Off. I'm your host, Mary O'Carroll. Before we dive into today's episode, just a quick announcement. Ironclad Live is coming to New York City on June 20th. So if you're in the area, we would really love to have you join us in person. This one is all about buy side contracting and how really smart teams can speed up and analyze all kinds of purchasing agreements. And if you can't make it live, we'll be rebroadcasting on June 22nd. So you can definitely join us virtually. To register for either the live or virtual events, please visit the Ironclad website for more details. Today, our guest on the show is Liam Brown, founder, chairman, and CEO of Elevate, which he launched in 2011 as a law company to provide consulting, technology, and services to both in-house teams as well as law firms. Before that, Liam was the founder, president, and CEO of Integrion, a global LPO, which he grew from a startup to eventually selling to a private equity investor. Before Integrion, he started a virtual data legal tech company. Prior to Integrion, he had started a virtual data room legal tech company, which he also sold. And today, he's a frequent speaker and legal tech investor and startup coach. In this episode, we touch on the emergence of the legal ecosystem and what that means and what we've seen from law companies and how they've evolved over time. We also talk about how difficult the modernization of a legal department really is and how much we've learned from, say, the generation of legal leaders who went ahead of us, how we can help those who are now rising up and going to be the next generation of leaders, and how can we get over the scars of our challenges and help to make it easier for those in the future. We're talking a little bit about enabling tech, how that can help us, and definitely leveraging partners to help legal teams be more successful. We do have a little fun and you'll get to hear why Liam and I consider ourselves spirit animals. And finally, we do touch on what is happening with change in the law firm environment. Some thoughts that I have just reflecting on our talk. You know, the legal ecosystem has grown tremendously, both in the number of companies in it, as well as the breadth of services provided now. And when we say ecosystem, you know, that's everyone who plays in the, in the delivery of legal services from the law firms to law schools, to law companies, alternative legal service providers, in-house teams, consultants, managed services, technology, and the list goes on and on. And that's really changed over time because you know we used to really have to rely on internal headcount as a legal department to get stuff done. But now if you're a general counsel or in a legal ops leadership role, you really should be thinking about how to take advantage of all these resources that are available to you. you know, I've spoken a lot to general counsel who say they really want to modernize, they really want to transform their departments, but they don't have that headcount to hire for legal ops. And that's unfortunate, but that also doesn't mean that you're stuck. You know, there are ways to do this now and modernize through outsourcing. There are opportunities to hire people for legal ops as a service, uh, and you can buy software and you know, still have contractors or managed service providers implement that and administer it for you. So you're, you're not alone. And there's definitely you know, a lot of flexible talent as another option that can help you as well. And then if we think about legal ops professionals, you know, I've talked a ton about how to be more strategic in your role, how to up-level your work, how to get out of the day-to-day -day management of the processes and the systems that you've put in place for your department. So, you know, think about it. If you've implemented, say, a contracts management system or an e-billing system or put it in a, put it a new process or what have you, you should always be thinking about who's going to administer that system, who's going to maintain that day to day, because that is going to be a real resource need. And if that's you, you know, you'll never sort of get out of that initial project. So nowadays you really can rely though on managed service providers, consultants contractors, flexible talent. There are so many options that give you the opportunity to free up your own time to do the big thinking, to start a new strategic initiative. And so if you want help, if you need referrals, if you need ideas about how to do that, uh, I'm definitely here for you. Happy to chat one-on-one -on -one anytime. Feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. But now without further ado, I'm excited to get into today's chat with Liam Brown. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Pearls on Gloves Off. I'm your host, Mary O'Carroll. Today, our guest is Liam Brown, founder, chairman, and CEO of Elevate. Liam helps general counsel and law firm leaders improve efficiency and effectiveness 
In 2011, he launched Elevate as a law company to provide consulting, technology, and services to law departments and law firms. Liam was previously the founder, president, and CEO of Integrion, a global LPO, which he led from startup in 2001 to an annual sales of $150 million by 2011 before it was sold to private equity investors. Prior to Integrion, he was the founder, president, and COO of a pioneering VC-backed Web 1.0 virtual data room legal tech company, which he sold to a public company in 2001. Liam is a frequent speaker at conferences and regularly publishes articles about trends in the legal sector. He is also an active investor in emerging legal technologies and an executive coach for founders of startups. Thanks so much for being here today, Liam. Thank you for having me. And that um, was, uh, I thought, a short bio. But when I listened to it, <laughs> I guess when you get to, you know, when you have a little bit of time in your career, you know, there's a lot to, there's a lot to introduce. So thanks well, for having me. Yeah, you've done a lot. I mean, you have an impressive bio that I just rattled off, but more fun. Isn't it also true that you were sort of like Doogie Howser child genius who graduated college at what was it, 16, 14? What's the, what's the story there? Yeah, no, that is not, I was definitely not Doogie. I definitely, I'd like to not think, think I wasn't Doogie Howser, but yeah, I did go to college uh, a few years early and, uh, and yes, I did study medicine and uh, I, uh, to my mother's continuing chagrin I found myself not liking sick people and I mean I really I know you're not supposed to say that out loud but I really uh I really enjoyed the the sort of intellectual challenge I'm sure lots of people will you know will wonder will see, see that we all like thinking about complicated problems and I really did enjoy that it's kind of like medicine's a bit like escape rooms okay um but uh, it's like zombie escape rooms. And what I mean by that is, you know, there are sick people and, and um, you know, and sick people need, you know, really do need care. And uh, I, when I was a young person, was not, not an especially empathetic uh, uh, person. I'm embarrassed to admit. Well, you know, you and I have so much in common, so I can kind of relate to that. My, my whole family is dentists and I was very young when I said, I, there's no way I'm going to be looking into stinky mouths all day. No interest in that. Thank you so much. Right. right. Um, um, I have that conversation with my uh, kids now and none of, none of them have any interest in being a business person, entrepreneur. Uh, you know, in fact, I'm actually quite grumpy about the fact that my eldest son uh, seems to have uh, an affinity or a real interest in becoming a lawyer. Can you believe it? That's what my daughter says to you. I think she just says that to make me angry. <laughs> I mean, so too. Okay, so I think you and I first met, I was trying to think back, and I'm guessing it'd have to be like 2010, 2011-ish. Yeah. Maybe you have a better memory than me, but I think it was probably when you came to speak at a very early clock meeting before, this is like before we were an official organization. Mm -hmm. And you came and did a presentation, and I believe it was the first time I ever heard the term legal ecosystem. Um, but that that was something you were thinking about for a while. Is that is yeah. that right? Like yeah, that's that is when that is that's uh, that that's my, that's when I think we met. And uh, it's interesting that you bring up that topic, legal ecosystem, because I have sometimes I shy away from terms that sort of seem consulting y or highfalutin, kind of not very plain spoken. But I have found myself coming back to that idea again and again and again over the decade or so that uh, uh, that we all have been you know working or known each other. Yeah. Okay. So how would you describe the ecosystem? Because I know you've seen you you advise both law departments as well as law firms, and you've seen we've all seen the ecosystem change over the last decade or two. Um, what what have you seen in, in terms of the changes of the roles of the companies or even the types of companies that exist in our ecosystem? Yeah, um, so I think I probably thought of ecosystem as just a word that captured the idea of uh, lots of different types of animal mm -hmm. um, operating in lots of different niches and I remember my, my mind is going back to that uh, to that talk because I, I remember it was you know you guys were all uh, really talking about your shared experiences and and sharing your experiences and I, I one of the things I remember was I think I had a slide that showed the legal ego system and I had a 
perhaps a perhaps a, a sort of picture of animals but at the top of the triangle was a person which i think was my way of saying look that's the that's the way that we have all thought of the legal world uh -huh. um, the lawyer at the top of the of the of the triangle and right. I, I think i then had a slide that perhaps showed a circle where the lawyer was you know was in the middle or somewhere of the but the but the i think the point of it for me when i was thinking about ecosystem was that law is really was really starting to permeate all sorts of elements of the business so the 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 the, the you know the, the idea that business people and lawyers were were forever separated except for the phone call asking for advice mm -hmm. seemed to me to be you know a a, a, a a sort of bit of an, ar an archaic perspective because business people started to have to have some legal training i know in my job you not being a lawyer but i but i have to consider all sorts of legal elements to the work that i do uh in contracting or commercial or managing people or risk or you know you know cyber i mean etc it's you know etc in the same way that i have to also have a whole bunch of other disciplines at my fingertips so I've, i i think i think of ecosystem reflecting the fact that there are all these all of us have different types of experiences and different adaptations i mean i know and now i'm really getting into it but you know that, that mean that we can can uh, uh play in different niches and those niches sometimes overlap so uh you know i've got this thing where i prefer to not call our our community alternative because i do think it's slightly it's vaguely pejorative it's vaguely not quite good enough but it just seems to me that that uh if you're a professional and i think about your career mary if you think of yourself as a professional you could be in a law firm you know one stage in your career the next stage in your career you could be in a law department right. and the, and the next stage in your career you can be in one of a, a numerous types of law companies in your case a, a, a software uh, law company but i think that the the concept of ecosystem for me touches on the we are a community of professionals and we and we and we work in businesses at points of time that fulfill different spaces and places and i remember when we were talking about the legal ecosystem we also started to talk about because i remember there was a whiteboard session and you were all sort of throwing up things like but okay but what about law schools for mm -hmm. example yeah or what about the regulator for example um when you get my point kind of we we quite quickly realized that you know that law was everywhere yeah and we had to think beyond you know just the law firm lawyer or the in-house lawyer as the only elements of that um well, ecosystem right and you have talked a lot about the role of law companies in the ecosystem and and, and you already touched on it right and this is one of your your hot issues your soapboxes so i want to give you an opportunity uh, to, to talk about the term law company and why you prefer that over ALSP alternative legal service provider or even the older terms LPO uh, or LSO right legal process outsourcer or legal services outsourcing yeah yeah well it will surprise you Mary to, to learn that I came to law company kicking and screaming and what I mean by that is when when we started Elevate, and you know, a number of us, there are a group of us who started Elevate together, and we, you know, we call ourselves the co-founders of Elevate. We, we really did struggle with this. We, uh, this, this first concept of, hey, we had previously built legal process outsourcers, and we'd sat in enough meetings where, in some cases, some law firm lawyers had, had said in meetings that we were in. Well, you know what we do isn't really a process, and you you know, and it, you know clearly it requires judgment and expertise, etc. And that actually made that that actually made sense. Uh, but but the, the the thrust of that was anyone else looking at solving routine problems at what I think of as the intersection of business and law. If they aren't a an expert in a law firm 
or possibly in a law department. But if they're not an expert that has the appropriate stripes of, of you, you, you know, seal of approval, then you're running a risk if you're a business person. And I remember th I thought to myself about that. I, you know, I remember thinking like, you know, that's not really a fair characterization. Of course, I call my uh, my uh, uh, outside counsel to help me think through, hey, what is the risk of or how do I navigate this or, um, uh, you know, you know, etc. But. But there are lots of problems where having an understanding of the legal issues that doesn't mean that, that doesn't mean uh, deep understanding but having a working understanding of the legal issues is actually sufficient to being able to solve this these these business problems and, mm -hmm. and one might argue that solving these business problems requires that you have not only a working understanding of the legal issues but a working understanding of the data issues or the technology issues or a working understanding of the how the, the politics of an organization, how decisions get made, and you know, etc. Right. And that's exactly a whole right. culture discussion, yeah. yeah. Um, but it did seem to me that a couple of those meetings had gotten under my skin enough that I thought, yeah, this is being used as a way to hold back uh, 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 well, I'll call them the alternatives. And I believe it's hard for me to separate myself from, you know, I do have a dog in the hunt, but I believe that holding that community back those members of the ecosystem actually holds back business in general because if they are if business in general is restricted to the only way to solve a problem is you must call outside counsel to get the quality you know the highest quality uh, uh advice uh, I believe two things happen not all problems require that but but more significantly if all problems do and I've said this to some managing partners you know, the supply of lawyers is just, you know, it isn't really growing. If you look at the growth of, you know, the sort of explosion of data, regulatory, uh, globalization, etc., there's the demand for more law mm -hmm. is undeniable. And so you can't, you know, eventually we'll all become lawyers if we, um, if the only way to solve it is the old way of working. And I know that law firms have, have done a great job of, uh, in, in my view, have done a great job of actually working through this and starting to modernize and think differently. Uh, and it's just a generational shift that we're all working, uh, we're working through. But um, it seems to me that we needed to get beyond this concept of alternatives, not quite good enough. And as I say, vaguely vaguely pejorative and so I know when I started to elevate and I talked to with my colleagues you know uh, uh, and when we talked to uh, you and your clock colleagues and when we talked to some uh, law firm leaders who started who were predicting ahead 10 years about war for talent and that kind of thing it just seemed to me that we that we would be better served to try to find a way that allowed individuals people to feel as worthy if they worked one day at a law department, another day at a law firm, another day at a law company, as opposed to creating this sort of extension of lawyer, non-lawyer, front or back office, um, which which permeates it permeates the profession. And uh, and I saw but it's a, I saw the same thing in medicine thirty years ago. You know, that's right. Uh, um, and I, and I really did really learn that lesson. I remember, I, I, I know I joked when I, I didn't really joke when I said that I didn't have a lot of empathy when I was younger, <laughs> but I did see how important it was to have all these different people around a patient. Right. Um, right. Uh, yeah, it was really important. And I feel like that's the journey that we are all on as we are modernizing, uh, modernizing law. Right. And, and we've, we've seen it in the past and we're going to continue to see it accelerate even more the the need for the changing roles and jobs and the resources that are available to deliver you know this increasing demand for legal services I, I I know that companies like elevate and other law companies do advisory work they do managed services work they do counseling work they do overflow work there are so many GCS right now that I talk to that know this massive transformation tidal wave is coming at them and they want to do something but they go oh, yeah, i don't have legal ops i don't have headcount i don't have a way to maintain systems once i get them up and running and i know when i started in in legal ops it was like me headcount and that that's all you had and now you have all these other options like you can transform your entire department 
without any headcount now because there are options like law companies. Yeah, yeah. You know what that reminds me? As you describe it that way, it reminds me. So my, my first the first company I ever started was the, the a data room company, and I remember back then we paid a lot of people a lot of money for. We probably paid back in ninety six like one hundred twenty thousand dollars for an HTML program. Okay, and there was massive demand for those people. So that feels a lot like legal ops in the last couple of years. Okay, um, uh, we had to build our own servers and we had to, I mean, literally you had to have your own iron, your own hardware, and you had to actually build all the various levels of the, of the sort of uh, the server stack, uh, you know, the web stack, but including cyber. Now, you know, we all know today that if we want to actually launch a new software uh, capability, there's kind of a, a sort of point and click way of being able to, to, uh, to build those capabilities. And I'm not uh, to build your own, uh, uh, website now or, your, or a web application i'm not and i'm not saying that we are at a place where we've matured from build it yourself pay people a lot of money because there are very few there are just very there's li limited talent um uh, uh uh design everything from scratch or every process from scratch every metric that you're going to measure navigate the the uh the political landscape for the first time you know I, I i'm not saying that we're we're through to this now point and click future but i think the direction of travel is clear and i i think when i think about when i think of of uh, our you know unfortunately very very good competitors uh when i but on a serious, on a serious note when i think of the the, the the competitors and i think and i and i that we're and we're all trying to build or participate in building the future I think that, again, if you have this more community view of things, a, a, a view of us all as professionals that can work in different places over our career, I think we're getting to a greater and greater shared understanding of what is actually possible. And you can, you know, I often say uh, you, can, you can imagine if you could do X, Y or Z. And in the past, you would say, but I, I mean, there are a few of you who had the native talents uh gc who was supportive uh, you know it's uh and you could kind of get things off the ground but now this has been democratized there's a lot more imagine if and i think the problem for us now is less less in what can what we could imagine doing i think now we just discovered that it's actually quite hard work and i think that i feel like we're all starting to now be re more realistic about not only is it clear that most of us or more companies want to do want to modernize law in the you know in the business we are um we understand the enterprise imperative of 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 law not slowing down the business we've got more and more of us with capabilities uh but we've also got some scars you know we've also got some uh, you know some skin knees and I, I i think a couple of years ago that held held us back a bit there was a little bit of like well that didn't work or that and i but i think now what's happening is this is emergence of the in the ecosystem people saying you know what it is hard if you want to transform i'll give us a parallel if you want to transform your sales organization you know it's actually quite hard to change the hearts and minds and systems and data and you know and processes and methods of of um and same thing in legal it's quite hard and mm -hmm. so when it gets hard we shouldn't say uh that was a crazy idea that person wasn't capable that provider um doesn't care um you know you know what i mean there's a, uh, so i think there's a just a growing awareness now of and i, I do think clock was a really big part that community a really big part of this but i think the general counsel rolling up their sleeves as well and actually saying instead of ops being um separate i think there's just a beginning awareness of uh the law department is multidisciplinary and and it requires both deep expertise in some areas it and it requires real experience and understanding of the culture and of the personalities and of the objectives of the business and the, and the people and it requires uh, uh, the ability to weave all of that together operationally uh, in into some sort of executable path and uh, uh, at risk of this actually preventing people from ever working with Elevate, I think that 
uh, you just got to go into this knowing that it is going to, uh, you, you know, your plan is going to meet the real world and you've got to pivot and duck and dive and, um, you know, know when to be patient, uh, know when to take a step back, um, be clear eyed about things that don't go according to plan, but actually come up with a way of, of mitigating and advancing, you know, mitigating those risks, advancing things, uh, because if we're not careful, there will be winners and losers. There will be some businesses. I'm thinking about a customer right now, life sciences business, where you know two departments. I'll say the I'll say the non-clinical and the clinical teams took very different paths to operationalize law. And as their business grew, they were a very successful business. You know, the people who who worked through the difficulty. Um, difficulties were able to much better respond to that that the business demands for growth than the people the 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 the, the legal team supporting the other half. You'll notice I'm careful not to say which is which, but who <laughs> did, who just said this is too hard and I don't really right. know who we want to operationalize and uh, and then when the demand did come through because the business was successful because the their you know their executive team which the law department is part of had a, a, executed well on their strategy. All of a sudden, this this becomes a bottleneck. Right, right. Well, I, it is hard. The job is very hard. Every conversation I have, kind of mentoring folks in this world, I, I and I think that's why the community and why Clock was successful is because it is such a hard job that you kind of need to rely on each other, mm -hmm. just to vent, but you know, to also have a common understanding of the journey um, and and the pitfalls and the best practices, and to share what's going to work and what's not going to work. I know. You already mentioned the importance of the community and our shared vision for building the future and understanding what's possible. That is a journey you and I have both been on for decades now, I think. Um, and I do want to just give you and your Elevate team some credit because, you know, we just talked about how we met probably in 2010, 2011 in the early days of Clocks, you know, when it was a book club. But you all were so critical in supporting us from our very first meetings to being the first sponsor to sign up and really write us a check and fund the business that we were going to create or this organization, this nonprofit, because you believed in this small group of misfits. And, you know, I often tell the story that I put it on my, uh, I put the first Institute on my personal credit card and kind of just held my breath, but you guys also put some skin in the game and kind of held your breath with us. And, and we jumped in. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, uh... It's an, it's interesting to see how this whole community has evolved and uh, and you know the fragmentation that happens. Uh, you know, I'm I'm not sure people are comfortable with me mentioning the fact that you know if you look at my peer group, I think about the other. Yeah, I'll say my peer group. There was a peer group that there was there sorry there was a group of people who we have stood on the shoulders of the people that came before before sure, sure. and the people who are the next cohort are standing on the shoulders of I'll say my peer group and one of the things I talk about with my peer group is hey you know we we didn't we didn't move as far or as fast as we hoped we would but we did move forward and we also have to kind of accept that now uh we, and we have to we have to really not only accept it, but we somehow have to find a way to celebrate the fact that the next cohort is uh you know the spotlight is on them there it's this is their time to shine, and we have to be comfortable with um not being at the center of things uh anymore and I think that's quite a hard thing i i i i think that's quite a hard thing uh uh you know for the for the as I say, the sort of group that was before my peer group and my peer group. And uh, and I, I somehow we've got to find a way to help. Somehow I think we have to find a way to help this much larger. Um, Next generation. Sort yeah, of I feel, yeah, yeah, exactly. I, exactly. And I feel it's not, and you, you might disagree with me on this one. I feel it's less about playbooks and practices which i think are those are absolutely important but i see them as hygiene factors now i think it's almost and you touched on it it's the coaching and mentoring and advising 
Uh, and I don't mean it in a fluffy sense. I mean it in the like, you know, how how do you persuade that difficult um, or that executive GC or CFO who doesn't really fully buy into what you're proposing? And, so, and by the way, sometimes it's because your proposal isn't really fully baked out, and you and that's part of the coaching. It's you know you actually need to do a better job of building, a, you know, a building a, um, a consensus, or you need to build a, a, or really surfacing what the um, what the uh, the burning platform is so that people feel it, um, but do it in a way that doesn't embarrass people. I mean, these are all, I mean, this, this, this is, this is, it's easier to talk about this when you've got the scars, but we don't want, we don't want the next group to just have to learn this, this and make the same mistakes that we did. We've got to find a way to help, uh, um, to help, yeah, to help them. And, and I know every, every person's situation is, is different, uh, um, but there are things, you know, there are things around change that you can, uh, and experiences that you've brought that you that can that you can uh, bring to the table. And uh, and I think I personally, one of the best things that the Big Four have brought to uh, their participation is that they have opened up much more of the conversation around providing experience, the value of experience. So in the past. I used to say, I, mean, I never say it quite like this, but I, I used to say, hi, I'm Liam. I've done this 12 times. Um, please listen to me. You know, yeah. But 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 now what happens is you walk into a situation and you can and you say and they've already had meetings with right. someone else from another credible provider. So that when I get to the point that says, you know, look, I'm Liam and I've done this 37 times you know please listen to me and there is there is this sort of they're all you know that the, they're already thinking I'm, I'm yeah. used to I'm, I'm open to being advised okay I'm right. not just buying a service where I want to direct kind of you know every step of the every step of the way I want to co-design a um uh, a path to this better future yeah I think this next generation is critically important and we have maybe set the stage for them. I want them to be successful and to, to learn from everything that we've put in place. But I really envy them because like you said, so much of the conversation is being forced by all these new entrants, right? And all this change that's happening that you cannot ignore in the industry. And so it's not the first time that people are hearing about efficiency, effectiveness, big four, different types of ways to deliver services, you know, all these options that are, that are available. You know, we talked about when I first started in, in the beginning of the early days of legal ops, it was do everything yourselves, figure mm -hmm. it out on your own, recreate the wheel in your silo. But now there's a community, now there's advisory services, now there's managed services, there's all this, you know, flexible talent that can come and help you. So they have a lot more options to get ahead. And I mean, we haven't even talked about the technology revolution and you yep. know generative AI that's happening yep. now that's bringing technology and transformation conversations into the workplace with right. you know serious gusto yeah yeah I look I, I really really agree with that I think one of the one of the excuses that's maybe too strong a word but I'll use that for a moment to make my point it's one of the excuses in the past of of, of uh, not building a law department that runs at the speed of business was i don't have a technology platform or i don't have a technology right. budget now and, and those two are related because if it's a lot of money then that there's a reason you know and, and if what got you here uh didn't cost very much then who wants to then spend another couple of hundred thousand dollars or more right uh, in yeah. but i i um I think anyone who knows me has have, have, has 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 said, look. Firstly, there are uh, there there has been an explosion of technologies that are all experiments, many and some of them very successful. Your company is an example of that. Very successful about they've found a use case and they've and they're really building a really usable experience. I I have remained committed to building digital in Elevate, not because I think we're going to build uh, a, a digital or, or a sort of legal platform for the GC or a sort of technology platform for the GC that is better than others will build. But it has been really useful when we work with some customers who have said, you know, I can only I can't really go very far because I don't have a technology platform. So at some point I said, OK, you know what, I'm going to take that problem away. I'm going to we're going to I'm going to deliver a workflow and a 
thwarting and a you know you know a, 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 a you know an AI powered capability that will be enough. And I think that I may you know in in five years I may find that I don't need that because there are enough uh, low cost. Going back to the conversation earlier on, there are enough low cost kind of you can buy them um, off the shelf, so to speak, uh, 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 um, offerings. I do, but but I I do feel this is important that some of us stay focused on the on the uh, digital enablement uh, and the, the software enablement of uh, uh, routine legal work. I, I, you know, I, we do a bunch of work with companies who have employed, I mean, obviously great software from, comp- you know, the sort of service nows of the world, for example. Okay, they're great. It's great software. But the and part is, is and they are um, built for a, a, a variety of cases, sometimes not law. And, you know, I, you know, we use we use you know one of these tools ourselves uh, in our in the way that we run our run our uh, accounting businesses or our HR pro and it's sort of in a, on an integrated platform. And you know, do I really want to kind of you know the work I have to do to integrate Workday and Carter and NetSuite and all you know all of that? It's a I can see that we're on this journey where where uh, uh, one day there will be one one sort of you know ERP ring to rule them all but for now look law departments need a good enough digital platform to do the to handle the use cases that are their day-to-day routine use cases um I've I've continued to invest in that because I think that if you can take that reason for not doing something away you you open up the belief that the legal ops or the law department has that they can actually work differently. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so I know that, I mean, that's the reason, that's the reason that that's the reason that I've kept uh, at it because I feel that the, you won't really get to routine scale managed services. If everything is built as a, a sort of custom set of workflows on whatever custom software environment that every law department in the world has, because every law department is unique because right. every business is unique. Right. I think right. you've got to, I think we have to also lean into um, uh, how do we as much as possible provide a standardized getting started platform that you can configure and connect. Um, uh, because if without that, I think there is a, there's a bit of a reliance to sort of spreadsheets and email. Yeah. Well, what are your thoughts on the one system to rule them all? Is that going to happen in the foreseeable future? Is that even valuable? Do we need that? Do we just need something that's purpose built for 80% and has good APIs? Like, what are your thoughts? So I put, look, I I think one day, I think we will see enterprise systems, you know, you know, will we see Salesforce emerge as a, you know, as the winner in, or will we see the, you know, some of the ELP, you know, SAP emerge as the winner in that. Um, uh, I, and this is very relevant conversation strategy discussion for your business. uh, I think that the, uh, the work streams in a law, that a law department touches and contracting is a good one. I think they are, unique and complex enough that the, 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 the next generation of software will be focused on solving those problems. Mm-hmm. Okay. So if you're, um, if you're pretty clear that your roadmap is I'm going to work on, you know, contracting next, and then I'm going to work on um, compliance. And then I'm going to, I mean, the fact is, is that you'll buy software for each of those, uh, each of those things. Uh, I think a lot of law departments to go on that path, they have to ask for materially more budget. And I mm-hmm. so I think that it is, but 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 not going on the path means that they won't be able to enable the enterprise. They won't be able to operate at the speed of the enterprise. So I think there's this tension that's emerging that, that I believe is um, most global companies are buying and building a, uh, uh, a more modern uh, infrastructure for law and just like in the accounting department, you're sort of put your or HR and you're putting it together and you're trying to connect with APIs. Um, I think that is going to be the way of the future for the next five years. I think mm-hmm. the, the, the idea that a couple of the big um, uh, legal and risk software providers are going to build, uh, you know, very large scale single platforms. Uh, 
they're going to be, they're going to have to be private equity backed. They are private equity backed. Mm -hmm. They're going to have to be therefore um, valuable and expensive. And they're going to be very sticky and there'll only be a few winners in that. Uh, so yeah, I, I think that, I think that we will see after this generation of technology over the next few years, I think we'll see another wave of, we'll see right. of a consolidation wave. Uh, and then I think we'll end up with, I think we'll end up with kind of with a couple of, of winners. And I, and I think the segmentation will probably be more around the size of company. You know, if you are a, if you are a global 1000 business, you will likely um, have a uh, uh, a platform that integrates a, a single legal platform that integrates with your your um, your single accounting platform or your single IT platform or your single sales platform. And I think that if you kind of push out even further, you know, in 15, 20 years, maybe sooner than that. But then I think there's a possibility of there will be kind of, you know, the enterprise, you know, the, the full enterprise stack and Legal is just perhaps the last or one of the laggards in this. And uh, I do think it's an important part of our roles. You know, legal ops, the law, the, the law company. Uh, well, I think we are helping provide the, uh, the advice, the, the software, the services to take steps down that path. But I do think it's going to be steps forward and back. You know, Mary, you and I have worked together in, yeah. in, you know, over the years as well. And, you know, I'd like to say that it always went went well and went easily, and I, I but I know that's not true. There were, you know, there are sometimes you have to take a step back in in, a, in order to take a step forward, um, and you need to accept that that our customers' priorities change as well. Absolutely. And, yeah. So I think that's another thing that we also have to kind of build. You know, the service provider community has got to be a bit more agile and adaptable and flexible um, to just deal with the fact that. Uh, not only do things not always go according to plan, um, but sometimes things do go according to plan. And then, and then you have a general council change and you're suddenly right. they want to head in a direction or, you know, you start the same team, but all of a sudden the business has, has acquired a, a, a business and has a very different set of priorities. Uh, um, so I think there's a, there's a, 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 a ton of opportunity uh, but it's there's no there are no shortcuts there and there are no quick fixes there's no That's right That's Lego right. blocks together I mean the only constant is change we say that again and again uh, it's a series of failures you know before you get that step forward like you said and and I think you're right there's the collaboration and and the relationships that we have across the ecosystem are so strong and there is uh, a lot of forgiveness because we understand we, we're trying to figure this out on our own right I know when uh, we at Google had worked with Elevate. It was kind of the first time either of us had done a project of that type. Yeah. And we had to figure it out together. And we took yeah. a couple steps backwards together and and we eventually made it forward, which is fantastic. And, and that paved the way for you know a lot of companies to follow after what we did. Um, yeah. But it's going to take, it's going to take some stumbling together to figure out what the future looks like. That takes a bunch of emotional resilience for the, the buyers I mean, yeah. I, I, I used, to, I, I'll never forget. I remember once having a meeting with you and we were talking a bit about your culture and your cu culture of the uh, company and how we would have, to, how we would work. And I remember I left and I, you know, I'd given you the assurances of like, you know, well, Elevate can be googly. And, you know, I remember, I remember that conversation, <laughs> but I, I remember getting um, in my car to go to the, you know, my next meeting. And I was thinking to myself, like, what happens if I don't, what happens to Mary if I don't do that? And I remember I just, it just crossed my mind that it was I thought like, OK, in my own company, what happens when an executive uh, uh, walks into my room, pitches an idea, I get on board with it and then it doesn't quite go according to plan because the reputation of that person is, uh, you know, you know we, we, we're human. We have this sort of, you know, how do people see us? And uh, sometimes they see us because we execute what we said we we're going to do we deliver on you know ahead of ahead of plan we deliver under budget and other times we are we get our reputation because we're really good at communicating problems when they you know um uh, as soon as we see them we get ahead of them we actually make sure that we bring um uh, supporters along we you know we we don't overreact when things don't go according to plan but we are clear-eyed about it so that we don't put good money on i mean this is you know i i you know i I think for the buyers or the builders of the future, there's a sort of emotional, reputational resilience that I 
I think we in the in the the builder provider community have got to be mindful of, and um, and we also need to also try not to get too uh, defensive as well. Because you know when I think about Elevate today, a hundred million dollar business, um, I've got a couple of customer moments where I'm like, yeah, I really really wish we hadn't put that customer in that difficult position for that moment. But largely, you know, largely. I mean, when I say largely, I, I mean, like the vast majority of the time, I think people would say, yeah, it was really, I, I got what I, I, you know, I got what I actually was, um, uh, I, I, I hoped for. And I think, I don't think we could have built this if we, me and my colleagues and our customers weren't prepared to take risks and sometimes um, uh, uh, have to work together to kind of get, get through things. And I think that, I think that that's one of the things that your community in particular the, 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 and I say when I say your community, I mean the, the 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 clock builder and buyer community. I think being able to rely on it, being able to rely on each other. How do you deal with your your manager when they are when they are unclear about their priorities? You know, how do you deal with I've cut I'm my, you know I'm over budget, or how do you deal with I didn't plan for this you know, uptick in business or down or down tick in business. And now I'm kind of flat foot. I mean, I, I, I think that the, I think there's more to community and belonging and feeling that we can lean on each other than meets the eye. Um, and in a business where we talk a lot about, uh, you know, the hour, you know, ast astronomical hourly bill rates, and it's quite easy to throw stones at, at that sort of the, you know, the kind of the, the sort of capitalist side of law but actually that's some that's that's just one dimension of it. it's just one dimension and that's kind of part yeah. uh, you know there's a it's a it's a there are a lot of people trying really hard and making progress that's right I, and the peer community is certainly one thing like you said where we can all help each other but the the ecosystem going back to the the term that i think you coined the legal e ecosystem there are such strong relationships and trust and ties because we are taking a leap of faith together. And, and that's why, you know, whenever we counsel people, we say, when you're trying to find the right vendor, whether it's software or managed services or advisory, you have to look for a partner. Don't just look for requirements, look for a partner who is going to help you and understand your needs and grow with you. Because like you said, that person is, is taking a risk in their company and their reputation is on the line. And when every one of the initiatives that legal ops is doing is trying to be successful to gain the trust of your stakeholders, you know, it, it's like, if I hire Elevate, you better be in this with me because we need to succeed. To, you got to make me look good. Right. And same with the software. Like I can't buy software. That's not going to work. We have one of the things, especially when there was that explosion of everyone wanted to do things all at the same time. You'd have to have this way of saying like, well, how do you not get sort of, you know, um, lured into a land war in Asia? You know, you don't want to work with with a customer that is has that, that may that may be a, 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 a optimistic, passionate person, but actually isn't supported by the rest of their organization or doesn't really have the budget or doesn't have the clarity of what next. Right. You know, um, so that comes back to the people side of things. You've got to find it's a partnership and it's a partnership over the, you know, over the, um, over the long run. So it has to be sustainable. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Interesting stuff. Okay. So we only have a little bit left. I do want to get to law firms. I also want to get to the fun stuff, which, okay, I'm going to pivot us to a little bit of fun since you mentioned people and tell the story of how you and I were sitting next to each other at a clock dinner in Vegas, 2017. And that's when we realized we were cosmically bound because <laughs> the stars of our backgrounds are so aligned. So I, I can't remember exactly how the story goes. I think we were sitting around and talking about our Myers-Briggs. Yeah. And that's when we both realized that we are both E and TJ um and and not just entj but quite extreme on some of the uh entjs and that's rare i think what is it like less than 20 percent of the world right is is yeah. the, that category yeah, yeah i think it's like i think it's something like six percent but yeah. six or eight yeah okay i think it's i think that's right so that's already like six or eight percent then we found out that we share the same birthday which again is like how many people in a room or at the same dinner table share the same mm -hmm. birthday. So mm -hmm. if anyone's mm -hmm. interested, so statistically, I think there's, a, I think someone can do the math on that, but I think that there is a, that is a statistically more likely than one thinks, but certainly not sitting opposite someone. 
Yeah. So, okay. So we're both August 13 Leos. If anyone wants to send us birthday cards and presents. <laughs> and we're very Leo as well. We are very Leo. So it, and then it gets better. So we're already sitting there going, what are the chances? What are the chances? And meanwhile, the rest of the dinner table is like, this is crazy. And then for some random reason, we decide to share what our favorite songs are. And that's the kicker. I'm going to, you tell the rest of the story. <laughs> well, that's right. We, I can't remember what, uh, maybe we were talking about, you know, concerts or, uh, uh, and uh, yeah. And uh, uh, as we were, as we got onto the, like our favorite song, favorite song, um, uh, you know, uh, Where Is My Mind by the Pixies. And, you know, uh, I couldn't believe, like at that point, when you know when we shared that though that we shared kind of at the same time we sort of blurted out at the same time it was a little it was a little bit like you know do you remember when when remember back in the day when we weren't sure if and forgive me if google was reading our email you know what i mean <laughs> but yeah it was one of those moments and you must have thought i was stalking you and because I, I thought, thought you, you were stalking me i thought you were pulling my leg when you said that's my favorite song i was like very very funny okay well, you know and you said i swear to god i said i swear to god <laughs> and, and randomly this is going to make you laugh even more than so uh random my, my son's home from university right now and his best friend from high school is visiting him and the uh, the movie that they um, um, sat down and we all watched last night was Fight, Fight Club. Club. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> Which, for those who are listening, this the scene at the end of the movie is is. Yeah. Where Don't give anything away. No spoilers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's wild. As and and the and the similarities continue. I mean, every time we talk to each other, we sort of find you know some quirky thing that we have in common. Like the last time we we sat down together, we discovered we both really adamant about making sure we find time to work out every day it's like a non-negotiable mm -hmm. yep even when we mm -hmm. travel we, we got to make that part of the day uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah you've got good memory you've had fantastic recall I those those were just like so many things that I thought wow me and Liam are like the same person <laughs> yes yes yeah I know very funny very funny Anyway. All right. All right. So back back to the work stuff for the law firms then. OK, so you also advise law firms as well as in-house teams. And I know on our podcast, we haven't had a chance to talk a lot about law firms, but their role in our ecosystem is certainly changing. We all know there are many things they should be doing differently. Um, I even hear now, at least outside the United States, a lot of clients are going to their law firms as advisors for tech roadmaps and yeah. you know what tech they should buy, which... Yeah. I don't think we do that much in the US, but it's certainly something I'm hearing more and more about. What is, what's happening in the world of law firms and what are they and what should they be doing? So the I, I think, uh, well, you know, I, I, I'm, uh, this might surprise people. So I'm quite an advocate for the, uh, the validity and importance of the role of law firms in, in different levels so this is the obvious one about the advice of law this that's obvious okay yeah that, yep. that will continue that'll continue that'll continue okay but the uh, uh i i do occasionally when people really are sort of like trying to give me a jab about this alternative thing i actually say well i think of the alternative um legal market as actually these advisory or uh, or legal ops or um uh, uh service centers or the technology strategies of, of law firms and what i mean by that is that's alternative to their core business okay their, their core you know uh their core business is advice of law um i think there is a real understanding across many law most law firm leadership teams and you know this because of your early career you know there there, there, there is some there was some very pioneering work that was done by some firms about thinking differently about the delivery of legal services. Sure, sure. Um, I, uh, I think that that is, a, there were a lot of experiments, not all of them have been successful, and I actually think they should be celebrated, by the way. I think it's yep. hard to sustain yep. in, a, in, a, in a business where you, at the end of the year, pay out your uh, profits to your partners I understand that whole feeling I mean I know it myself I think about my colleagues we you know we you know we spent years not paying ourselves as we were you know plowing the money back into the business so I understand there's a limit to how much money you want to spend in investing in building your you know for bear with me be for a minute alternative legal um uh, capabilities to the core of the advice of law so I think some of those business those, those law firm experiments that that that, that our community 
these people might not feel were great successes, I still say, I still commend them for having tried, um, uh, learned something. And the only thing that they really discovered was that was the limits of the of that of that particular law firm partnerships uh, investment appetite. But some of these businesses have been very successful. You've seen you've seen you've seen um, the the some of the service centers that have been built have been uh, have really transformed the uh, the price point of delivering uh, of delivering uh, legal projects. Uh, in some cases, have just have made them doable in the regulatory or other timeline, otherwise, which they wouldn't have been before. And I think there's a beginning of res respect for the other disciplines that are part of these law firms, whether or not it's the data science capability or whether or not it's the innovation capability or the, or the software capability or the consulting and advisory capability. And I, I've been careful not to use names in the, you know, in the, in, you know, in this, but I, I think about some of the people who are running these um, uh, law firm enterprises and they are, you know, they are uh, world-class. And what I mean by that is I would, I would, well, some of them used to work at Elevate, uh, but I was about to say, I would hire them to be at Elevate. And I think my peers would, 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 would want them to be part of their organizations. Uh, they are, they, you know, they're great. And I, um, I think that they're, that, they, they have brought a lot of the experimenting from law departments, a lot of the experimenting from the law companies into law firms. And I know that the vast majority of law firm partners, you know, are sort of heads down working the way they were working. But, but, but one customer or one client, one, one project at a time, these lawyers are learning that there are some times that working differently or as I call it, delivering differently um delivers value so I'm I'm I'm, optimi I'm optimistic about law firms about you know almost, I think something like 40 percent of elevates revenue is law firms yeah yeah law firms. so I uh so I suppose again I got a dog in the hunt so you can kind of take what I said with a with a bucket of salt but I I think that law firms are are also real uh, sources of in innovation and collaboration um, uh, and I actually think that this new way, these new ways of working have virtually insignificant impact on the economics of their core business. You know, I do occasionally hear, well, aren't companies like you, I was at a dinner with a managing partner uh, who was really in my face about, well, you're just, you know, you're, you know, you're barbarians at the gate, kind of law companies are clawing, you know, a, 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 you know, clawing away at law firms. And I was like, I, I really do not. I do not see that. Your yeah, I disagree. Even, exactly. I won't even. Mm -hmm. I won't even bother with the. I'm not an economist. <laughs> either, I won't even bother with the argument that I, you know, that I, um, I made. There's more demand for law than ever. Yeah. Evidenced in pricing, um, uh, which <laughs> seems to only go in one direction because of the laws of economics. And I think we have to find these alternative ways, or these, or this ability to deliver differently, in order to meet the accelerating needs of the enterprise and that is that, that is just becoming more digital faster i think that my law firm friends they embrace all of us help doing a lot of the experimenting right you can then they build should. on i think they should yeah I, and i i think for the first time i am seeing real change in the law firms and kind of their mindset and how they can work with other companies in the ecosystem and where they can add value to their clients. So I'm hopeful. I think it's great. Um, there's a lot, there's a lot of change happening right now. It's exciting. Yeah, I agree with you. I, yeah. agree. I agree. Well, Liam, thank you. As always, I know we could probably keep talking, but this has been such a pleasure and so great to have you on the podcast. Well, thank you for having me.